Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hello everyone, it is Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now this week we have another exciting two-part series for you. We are speaking with Max Kurz and Mike Smith, two gentlemen who could be dubbed the founding fathers of the Australian Institute of Business Brokers, otherwise known as the AIBB. Now, in this episode, part one, we reflect on the fascinating changes Max and Mike have seen in the business broking industry and its processes from the time they first stepped into the industry to the present day. We drill into how the AIBB was formed the significance of education and training for the evolution of business broking and changes to the remuneration model over time. So without further ado, here's our discussion with Max and Mike. A huge welcome to you, Max and Mike, to the Deal Room podcast. Can I just say it is an absolute pleasure to have the two of you on board today. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Well, happy to be here. <laughs> Love it, love it. Why don't we just start with a very quick background? Maybe if if I move to each of you and you give me a really quick background, tell us when you got started in business broking, and and why. What launched you in there? Maybe Mike, we can kick off with you. I was thinking about getting involved in real estate, and I didn't like the idea of seven days a week. And then I discovered the idea of selling businesses, and I thought <clears throat> that sounds like a whole lot more fun. And quite frankly, at that stage, the business brokerage industry had a bad reputation. And I thought, good, that's fine. That, that's, that's got to be an opportunity for someone who does it right. And um, they were the, mo- the main motivators, actually. I wanted to get out of the corporate life that I was in, and uh, which involved too much overseas travel and everything else. So uh, this appealed to me. Uh, it, it proved to be a challenge. First few years were much more difficult than I thought. But as time has gone along, um, the industry's had its ups and downs, but it certainly, it certainly is an interesting business to be in because every business that you're involved in is different. I love it. And so what year was that? What year was it that you started? 81, I think. 1981. Okay. So, um, so, so that was, so that's, you almost turned um, 20, 40 years in the industry. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yep. That that's right. is amazing, absolutely amazing. And Max, maybe tell us what year did you start and how did you get started? Well, I'll try to encapsulate it very, very briefly. Uh, virtually, I started off in 1960 as a real estate agent. Yeah. Uh, four years later, I completed my degree at the University of uh, Sydney University uh, in, in uh, conjunction with the REI Extension Board to become a property valuer. And um, from there on, I became a property developer. So I had three strings to my bow. Estate agent, which I didn't like. I didn't like real estate. I property valuations and virtually property developer. And all that came to a conclusion in 1981, interestingly enough, uh, the same year as Mike, uh, when I built a shopping center up in Port Stephens called the Bay Village, and I had to develop three businesses within that complex, and I did a lot of research in starting three businesses off. I owned the 14 shops there, and as a result of that, I liked it. I liked the whole challenge of building a business, and I thought, goodness, I wonder how this would go as akin to real estate, and I became a business agent, knowing nothing about the the industry, but like Mike said, uh, it was not a good uh, look in terms of a profession to be in it wasn't even a profession at that stage and no. consequently I think that was an opportunity uh, for me as it was for Mike. Fabulous I love it gosh I um I, I just can't even believe it like this is just such a great I, I just there, there are so many questions that I have I don't even know where to start and and, and you know I'll start with 
the comment that you both made that the industry was very different back when you started and um and w- why don't we why don't we start there then what what was the industry like why was it different and and how i i guess just in a snapshot what are the biggest changes you think have have had been had in the industry over time can i just offer that comment can i commence with that one it was very yeah. fragmented there was a very small number of business agents and business agents weren't even on the on the radar mm. they weren't even known i mean one of the biggest difficulties if you had if you went to a client for the first time a to basically convince somebody to uh, about the value of your services but the first uh, hurdle was to explain to anybody, uh, business owners, stakeholders, lawyers, accountants, what a business agent was. Nobody's ever heard of a business agent. Business. How did they sell businesses then if they hadn't heard of business With agents? Diff- difficulty. A lot of the businesses were in the SME market, particularly in the, uh, in the food industry and mm. the buy yourself a job type businesses. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could virtually see the number of business agents on two hands. You only had to remit, read the Sydney Morning Herald businesses for sale columns to see who was active in the marketplace. Wow, interesting. It, I mean, fascinating, but obviously there were businesses then um, and businesses needed to be sold. So was it just that everyone did it themselves? Yes, and I think we're, we're doing it badly, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think there was any framework or or education or uh, understanding of the, I mean, business transactions, as we all know today, is complex. It's it's a minefield. It is a you've minefield, to, yeah. You've got to know how to navigate it. Yeah. And you've got to be able to do it well. I always think you've got to be a masculine to be in this business, quite mm. frankly. Um, I mean, you've got to be part lawyer, part accountant, part psychiatrist, part this, part this, and part everything else. <laughs> Psychiatrist, I love that one. That's so true. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is it really is true. It's probably it applicable yeah. to other professions, but particularly as, as a business agent, that recognition wasn't known. Uh, I mean, it was cheek by jowl at that time, and it probably was one of the motivating factors that really uh, encouraged us to think about the formation of AIBB. And how that, yep. as a vehicle, can basically provide the infrastructure, the resources, and the uh, framework in order to basically uh, drive the profession of business transactions. And so, I, I guess with that, um, you know, I, I, that just begs the question of how was it that you started AIBB? So, so you you were the uh, founders of AIBB, were you? Is that right? Is that how yeah. it all? Look, look, it was very interesting. We we attended a meeting in the, the REI headquarters in Wentworth Avenue in the city, and at the conclusion of that meeting, uh, we found ourselves on the pavement outside the uh, the building. And it was Bob Ridding, Garth Griffiths, Mike Smith, and myself. And we were looking at each other, wondering what the hell's going on here. I mean, we were a part of an organization who virtually, understandably, and uh, we acknowledged the fact their prime objective was real estate and the needs of uh, the services provided by real estate agents. Business brokers, business agents just didn't fit into the uh, picture. So consequently, uh, I think it was at that point that was the deciding moment where we decided, no, we need to do something and get our own organisation. So it was a long, hard slog uh, from 1986 to 1989 when we finally launched uh, AIBB. There was a lot of work to be done, and it was done by ultimately the end. Of the Bob Ridding dropped out of the picture, and the drivers behind that was Garth Griffiths, Mike Smith, and myself. Fascinating. That must have been a huge, huge amount of work. What what drove you, Mike, with you, you know being part of this initial group to to start up AIBB? Oh, I think for us, all of us, really, I think it was quite clear that we had to have an independent industry body. The REI was busy looking after the real estate people and doing probably a very good job. 
But we were the poor orphan of their group. They had strata title managers and valuers and stock and station agents and business brokers. And uh, business brokers were probably the smallest group. And we were, the, we were the poor orphan. And so we weren't really been taken seriously. And there were a number of significant issues that came up where we felt that we were not, well, we thought we were hard done by, frankly. Mm. And so we all decided that oh, this has got to stop. We need an independent body to look after the group. And we thought, well, surely we can, we can do good things for the industry. We really believe that. And, and I think uh, proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so I think over time that is absolutely proved to be correct. Uh, we wouldn't wish to go back. And I think what the AIBB has done, um, myself and Max sort of got involved in the early days, not as much these days, but, but what the AIBB has done over the period has been nothing short of fabulous. And I think we'll continue to go on to bigger, brighter and better things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just amazed. And I guess everything Everything, every organisation association must have started with a few people, but it's just amazing to hear this evolution because, you, you know, um, I, I'm a huge believer in education um, for people within the industry, you know, um, that's why I've got hundreds of podcasts and a book because I believe so strongly in it, but it, it's people like the two of you who've started organisations that actually, I, I think, you know, you should just... I hope you feel incredibly proud of the movement that you've started because it's such an important thing. Um, and, and I guess there's still, there's still, it's an interesting, I've found it an interesting evolving space, even over the last decade, but you just must have seen so, so many changes. So we talked about that, the, the industry back when you both started being very embryonic, um, you know, they're really not being an industry at all. So, so how did it evolve? What, what are some of the, I guess, the trends that you've seen come in over time? Other than, of course, just a lot more, you, you know, people who are acting as business brokers, more of an understanding of the role of business brokers in, in selling a business. I guess that bit sounds obvious from your story, but, but what are other trends? What things have you seen change over time? I think the underlying foundation for the success of, of business broking today, and particularly as a result of AIBB, has no doubt been education and training. Mm. Yeah, there wasn't. Definitely. It was just non-existent. Mm. You, even as a, a, a new fledgling of a business agent, where were you going to go to get mm. information on the sale of businesses? There just wasn't any. So mm. there was a tremendous amount of emphasis on education and training. Uh, there was a, uh, we had to um, make ourselves known to the Department of Fair Trading. Uh, we, we had a partnership with the uh, TAFE College. Uh, there were so many other regulatory bo bodies and and uh, and information and uh, framework of education and training that had to be set up in order to um, uh, provide a foundation where people can, can start from. So I think that was the big change. So when people became more educated, and then of course what's happened. A lot of uh, brokers now have understood the process of transaction in the business from the very time that you meet your client, from the very time that you do an appraisal uh, or evaluation, from the time that you virtually list your business for sale, uh, the due diligence process, the negotiating process, the conveyancing process, the final transaction process. There's so many parts to the process which was broken up and conveyed in such a way that people became more knowledgeable about that particular process. And how, uh, you know, th there's a few things that occur to me that I'm particularly interested in because I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated with how these things may have changed. So I'm going to start with the remuneration model. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a um, strong focus uh, these days with business brokers being paid on success and, you know, being 
paid a, a commission or proportion of uh, the sale value. Um, and also um, I'm seeing brokers move in to, um, particularly in sort of larger transactions, retainer models these days where they're paid retainers along the way for work that they do, um, uh, you, you know, as, as they work through the sale process, because we all know it's a very long process that you poor brokers have to work through. How's that remuneration model changed over time? What what was it when you started? Um, or did you have to make it up at the time? Was there nothing set in place and you had to come up with a way to make this work? Yeah, well, I think it's one of these things that evolved, frankly. I uh, I think as, as we got more professional, we saw the need to charge an appropriate fee for the work that we did, whether it was a retainer or whether it was commission on settlement, whatever. And as time went along, we found that it was more and more important to charge an appropriate fee and the fees were, were, were rising because frankly, business sales were getting more complicated, ah. far more complicated. Ah. And over um, decades, we've had a succession of governments say that, oh, you know, we're going to come to power, the federal government will come to power, we'll do this, we'll do that, and we'll cut the red tape for small business. We'll make the, the lot of small business so much better because there'll be a whole lot less red tape, which was absolute rubbish because over the next five years, the amount of red tape went up, not <laughs> down, went up. And if you look at the standard contract, you will see that over the years, that's that's gained pages and pages because they keep bringing new legislation in that needs to be mentioned in the standard contract. So they revise the contract again, add an extra page to the back and put in 14 more clauses and so forth. And so we found ourselves in a position where what we were doing was infinitely more complicated than what it was 10 years earlier. Mm. And in fact, even now, I think it's it's much more complicated than 10 years ago. And I predict that in the future, it'll be much more complicated too. Um, mm. So there was a need to <clears throat> charge a fair and reasonable fee for what we were doing. And it sort of evolved, you know. I don't think it's anything more than that. I, um, yes, the fee structure is becoming more sophisticated. We do get some people now talk about retainers and so forth and, and larger upfront fees and this sort of thing. But it's but the industry is fundamentally the same in that regard. You know, ninety five percent of people are working on the basis of there might be some minor fee to list the business for sale, and then there's a success fee at the other end, and uh, that would be ninety nine percent of the sales, I'm sure, right? And mm. so that will continue. I'm not quite sure that I altogether agree with one part of what you said, Mike. I, I think look. Yes, we, we were, it was performance based. We all started out, that was the fee remuneration. It was all performance based. But over time, particularly through the education pro process with AIBB, business agents, people learned about time and money, the value mm. of time and money. And virtually, you remember what I referred to as compartmentalizing the process. So at the beginning, you undertook a val uh, evaluation and appraisal. Now, I think there's a lot, particularly a lot of the people that I've mentored or, or uh, have attended my appraisal workshops, uh, we talk about a fee for service in terms of an appraisal. So we've got the, the fee structure based on performance fee, but also fee for service built into the um, performance structure. Yep. So you can get an appraisal fee. You can get fees paid for marketing, which and when we you and I started, Mike, didn't exist. No. We carried all the costs. Yep. I mean, advertising costs the whole lot. Now, a client virtually has a vested interest in, in the sale of their business. So yes. they pay all the marketing. So there's appraisal mm. fee, there's marketing fee. Uh, I charge a fee for basically preparation of information memorandums. And then there's a fee, there's a, a performance fee. And in some cases, it has become a little bit more sophisticated, even in the SME market, where we're talking about part retainer and the balance paid on a performance fee. Mm. Now, yeah. uh, we started all that in, um, in the 1990s uh, because what was evolving also 
people learnt the difference, the distinction between a walk-in, walk-out sale as opposed to an earn-out, as opposed mm. to a buy-out. So mm. there's all different schemes of arrangements that we entered into in transacting businesses, and they become more complex, even in the small to medium enterprises, mm. businesses that fall into the million to five million dollar bracket, uh, where owners are not necessarily retiring at the at the conclusion of the sale. There's an ongoing involvement by the outgoing owner, and I won't go into the complexities of that. But there, there are complex. So that's where the fee structure started to change. And I think a lot of people are becoming a lot more educated about that part of the process. Absolutely fascinating. One of the things that you mentioned just there, Max, was um, uh, uh, something about multiples. And, I, and it led me to wonder, um, do, have the, how, how has valuation changed? Um, and has, you know, have the multiples changed? Has, has valuation, you know, always been a reflection um, of, you know, a multiple apply, applied to the profit in the business or has that as well changed? Yes, that's changed dramatically. A lot of people virtually, uh, I remember back in the early 80s, people used to ring me up and say immediately, I've got a business that's a uh, chicken shop. What's the multiple? Well, you know. Give me a break. I mean, what is the multiple? <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something that expected to come off the uh, off the tip of your tongue. You know what I mean? As if you know immediately a chicken shop is two and a half times. A news yeah. agency is one and a half times. A coffee shop is so much. No, it doesn't work that way at all. So um, the multiples, the method by which you determine value by way of a multiple of earnings hasn't necessarily changed. It's the mechanism within understanding how that is applied, the methodology that's changed. That's become a lot better understood. Um, I think even by uh, uh, lawyers and accountants and uh, their clients, mm. uh, I think that's become a little bit more um, uh, more informed. So yeah, I think that's... Mm. And what about the players in, in the industry? So, you know, um, and, and when was it that business broking licensing came in? Do, do you recall? I don't recall. It's been there for a long, long, long yeah. time, well before I was involved. Max, mm. do you have any idea when it came in? Well, licensing has always been there for New South Wales. Yeah. But it goes back a long Wales. way, wouldn't it? Yeah, licensing has always been there. 2003 was the introduction of the CPD. Um, uh, I remember that clearly because you and I were teaching at TAFE at that particular time. Yep. And um, so we were doing um, a continual professional development work and that was a requirement by the Department of Fair Trading. And so you had to, AIBB had to become uh, uh, able to provide that, uh, um, that, uh, teaching that facility it was always there from the beginning and, and always connected to um uh to property uh, so, which i i think you know this real estate connection is such a i think it, it, it's, it, it's fascinating it's, unusual thing it, it, look it, uh, it, it it's going to open up a whole pandora's box i mean that, mm. that, that's a that that's really another conversation in itself. <laughs> it's that's a, another it's, podcast it really is a problem uh we've been labelled under the Property Act in terms of being licensed under the, uh, 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 you know, so, yeah. I recall when I first started working in the industry, I just thought it was, inc I just thought it was so bizarre. Very, very, very bizarre. And, you know, I understand the connection of small businesses to often selling property, but, you know, the, the number of businesses that, uh, to, sorry, they, who own the property um, that their business runs out of and, and so they sell it as well, you know, I don't know if that's where the connection stemmed from, but, um, you know, I would say in 80 to 90% of the transactions we're involved in, there's absolutely no property element whatsoever. Uh, and, very rarely. You know, very, and, very rarely. 
Mm. And it's Very such relevant. complex, there's so much complexity, you know, as you rightfully say, you know, in relation to employees and, you know, all sorts of things that we need to think about structure um, w within a business sale environment that it just seems so incredibly disconnected from, mm. Uh, mm. from the sale of property. But anyway, that's my perspective. Glad to hear the perspective of others yeah, as well. You've got to remember that the business agents industry is a very small component mm. compared to real estate for example if you draw a comparison to real estate very very small we, we still know, don't know to this extent the uh the areas in which this small businesses are being sold either by accountants by business agents or by others mm. We don't have a full comprehension of that. Uh, we only know now more statistically exactly uh, the level of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the geographics and the uh, demographics of business agents selling businesses. Well, that actually was going to be my next question. I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, the, the change, if there has been over time in who has been involved in business sales. I, I recall a point where, um, you know, there are a lot of accountants who seem to be getting involved in uh, business sale activity. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I feel, you know, that certainly changed over time. What do, do you feel, have you seen mixes change over time? What's been your anecdotal experience? Mike, do you want to go on that one? Oh, okay. Um, no, I don't. I don't know that, that. I mean, a lot of accountants look at business sales and think this is an easy make my easy way to make a dollar. Uh, you know, I know about businesses. I've got a lot of clients, a lot of contacts. So I should be able to sell businesses, and they give it a fling, and then they find out it's really not all beer and skittles, and, and get out. They're always going to be there, in my opinion. Uh, accountants playing around the edges of business sale. I can't say that we've seen any great change in that over time i mean 20 30 40 years ago there were business brokers playing around the edge and there still are today they're a nuisance um frankly i think that about i've always said this probably 95 percent of accountants business owners business buyers and even lawyers too to be frank with you don't really understand about business sales mm. it's a very complex matter unless you're involved in it full-time for several years, you can't be expected to understand mm. what it's all about. If you've owned, you know, four or five businesses and you've sold them privately, then I think that would probably give you a pretty good head start and you probably do know what it's all about. But mm. that is absolutely rare, absolutely mm. rare. And mm. I think it's the same with accountants. I see all sorts, I mean... I'm, I might sound like I'm a whinger, but I, I see all sorts of things sort of going on. Um, I think I said at the conference just recently that we just recently seen a report from a, a client of ours, went to his accountant and said, listen, I'm confused about what my business is worth. Can you value it for me? The accountant said, no, no I don't do that kind of work. He was smart. I'll refer you to a consultant person who does a lot of that sort of work and they will do a proper job, right? Mm. Oh, great. Okay, away you go. $13,000 later, uh, this person got a report back that was absolutely a waste of time. Mm. Uh, it, it showed that the business was worth twice what it was worth. Um, we had to have some spirited discussions with the owner who later on said, yeah, I didn't really believe that report anyway. So I think what you're saying makes more sense to me than what my consultant did, than what my mm. consultant has said. Uh, so I'll go with you. We listed it, and I think we sold it within 5% of the price that we told them it was worth, right? Mm -hmm. It was simply a case where someone was ex um, expressing an opinion, and frankly, they didn't really know what they're talking about. Mm. Now, that that will go on, I think, forever. Mm. Um, and it it is a distraction to us, and it is a bit of a nuisance, but I think it's going to continue. So mm. all we can do is try and educate people through the AIBB, keep training, uh, upgrade our standards all the way along and hope that you know, over time that sort of phases out.
Have you heard of Aspect Legal's partner program? Our partner program is a free program that's open to brokers, corporate advisors, accountants and any other advisors to businesses who are dealing with organisations that are leading into a sale or acquisition of businesses or shares. As part of our partner program, we offer free access to our legal hotline, which is a support line to our specialist lawyers. We also provide a pre-free sale legal review to buyers and sellers where we educate them about the process and timelines from a legal perspective. And the third element that forms part of this partner program is a match-up database that we run where effectively we're able to connect up accountants or brokers or corporate advisors with businesses who are looking to either sell or acquire. So if you're a partner of ours, you go straight into that partner database and where we can see opportunities to provide matchups, then we introduce you. And the final element of our partner program is ongoing education in the form of seminars, webinars and meetups. And that's something new that we're introducing into the partner program in early 2020. So if you're not a partner, then all you need to do to become a partner is just pop us an email at partners at aspectlegal.com dot au and just simply say in your subject column, I want to become a partner. It's as easy as that to get immediate access to our free legal hotline and all of those other resources. We look forward to having you on board as a partner. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.